section 36, page 181. Mr. Jackson nodded carelessly. Everyone had heard the rumors in question, and he scorned to confirm a tale that was already common property. A gloomy silence fell upon the party. No one really liked Beefort, and it wasn't wholly unpleasant to think the worst of his private life. But the idea of his having brought financial dishonor on his wife's family was too shocking to be enjoyed even by his enemies. Arker's New York tolerated hypocrisy in private relations, but in business matters it exacted a limpid and impeccable honesty. It was a long time since any well-known banker had felt this credibility, but everyone remembered the social extinction visited on the heads of the firm when the last event of the kind had happened. It would be the same with the Beforts, in spite of his power and her popularity. Not all the leaked strand of the Dallas connection would save poor Regina, if there were any truth in the reports of her husband's unlawful speculations. The talk took refuge in less ominous topics, but everything they touched on seemed to confirm Mrs. Arker's sense of an accelerated trend. Of course, Newland, I know you let dear May go to Mrs. Stoddard's Sunday evenings, she began, and May interposed gaily. Oh, you know, everybody goes to Mrs. Stoddard's now, and she was invited to Granny's last reception. It was thus Arker reflected that New York managed its transitions, conspiring to ignore them till they were well over, and then, in all good faith, imagining that they had taken place in a predecessing age. There was always a traitor in the saddle, and after he, in parentheses, or generally she, had surrendered the keys, what was the use of pretending that it was impregnable? Once people had taste of Mrs. Stutter's easy Sunday hospitality, they weren't likely to sit at home remembering that her champagne was transmuted shoe polish. I know, dear, I know, Mr. Arker sighed. Such things have to be, I suppose, as long as, as amusement is what people go out for. But I have never quite forgiven your cousin, Madame Alaska, for being the first person to countenance Mrs. Stutter's. A sudden blush rose to the young Mrs. Arker's face. It surprised her husband as much as the other guests about the table. Oh, Ellen, she murmured, much in the same accusing and yet deprecating tone in which her parents might, might have said, oh, the blankers. It was the note which the family had taken to sounding on the mention of the contents Olenska's name, since she had surprised and inconvenienced than by remaining obdurate to her husband's advances. But on May's lips, it gave food for thought, and Arker looked at her with the sense of strangeness that sometimes came over him, when she was most in the tone of her environment. His mother, with less than her usual sensitiveness to atmosphere, still insisted, I have always thought that people like the contents Olenska who have lived in aristocratic societies, ought to help us to keep up our social distinctions, instead of ignoring them. May's blush remained permanently vivid. It seemed to have a significance beyond their implied by recognition of Madame Anaska's social bad fate. I have no doubt we all seem alike to foreigners, said Miss Jackson tartly. I don't think Ellen cares for society, but nobody knows exactly what she does care for, May continued, as if she had been groping for something non-committal. Oh, well, Miss Arker sighed again. Everybody knew that the Countess Olenska was no longer in the good graces of her family. Even her devoted, devoted champion, old Mrs. M Manson Mingott, had been unable to defend her refusal to return to her husband. The Mingotts had not proclaimed their disapproval aloud. Their sense of solidarity was too strong. They had simply, as Mrs. Vellon said, let poor Ellen find her own level, and that, mortifyingly and incomprehensibly, was in the dim depths where the blankers prevailed, and, 
people who wrote celebrated their untidy rights. It was incredible, but it was a fact that Ellen, in spite of all her opportunities and privileges, had become simply bohemian. The fact enforced the contentation that she had made a fatal mistake in not returning to Count Alansky. After all, a young woman's place was under her husband's roof, especially when she had left it in circumstances that, well, if one had cared to look into them. Madame Alanska is a great favorite with the gentleman, said Miss Sophie, with her air of wishing to put forth something conciliatory when she knew that she was planting a dart. Ah, that's the danger that a young woman like Madame Alanska is always exposed to. Mrs. Arker Monforde agreed, and the ladies, on this conclusion, gathered up their trains to seek the castle globes of the drawing room, while Arker and Mr. Mr. Slerton Jackson withdrew to the Gothic Library. Once established before the great, and consoling himself for the inadequacy of the dinner by the perfection of his cigar, Mr. Jackson became portentous and communicable. If the Beaufort smash comes, he announced, there are going to be disclosures. Arker raised his head quickly. He could never hear the name without the sharp vision of Beaufort's heavy figure, apparently feared and shot, advancing through the snow at the skyter cliff. There is bound to be, Mr. Jackson continued. The nasty is kind of a cleaning up. He hasn't spent all his money on Regina. Oh, well, that's discontinued, isn't it? My belief is he will plot yet, said the young man, wanting to change the subject. Perhaps, perhaps, I know he was to see some of the influential people today. Of course, Mr. Jackson reluctantly conceded. It is to be hoped they can tide him over, this time anyhow. I should not like to think of poor Regina spending the rest of her life in some shabby foreign watering place for bankrupts. Arker said nothing. It seemed to him so natural, however tragic, that money ill-gotten should be cruelly expated, that his mind hardly lingering over Mrs. Beaufort's doom, wandering back to closer questions. What was the meaning of May's blush when the contents of Alaska had been mentioned? Four months had passed since the midsummer day that he and Madame Alaska had spent together, and since then he hadn't seen her. He knew that she had returned to Washington, to the little house which she and Madara Manson had taken there. He had written to her once, a few words, asking when they were to meet again, and she had even more briefly replied, not yet. Since then, there had been no further communication between them, and he had built up within himself a kind of sanctuary in which she throned among his secret thoughts and longings. Little by little, it became the scene of his real life, of his only rational activities. Titter, he bought the books he read, the ideas and feelings he, he, which nourished him, his judgments, his visions. Outside it, in the scene of his actual life, he moved with a growing sense of unreality and insufficiency, blundering against familiar prejudices and traditional points of view as an absent-minded man goes on bumping into the furniture of his own room. Absent, that was what he was, so absent from everything most densely real and real to those about him that it sometimes startled him to find they still imagined he was there. He became aware that Mr. Jackson was clearing his throat preparatory to further revelations. I don't know, of course, how far your wife's family are aware of what people say about, well, about Madame Alanska's refusal to accept her husband's latest offer. Arker was silent, and Mr. Jackson obliquely continued. It's a pity, it's certainly a pity, that she refused it. A pity? In God's name, why? Mr. Jackson looked down his leg to the unwrinkled sock that joined it to a glossy pump. Well, to put it on the lowest ground, what's she going to live on now? Now? If Beaufort Arker sprang up, his fist banging down on the black walnut edge of the writing table, the wells of the brass double ink stand danced in their sockets. What the devil do you mean, sir? Mr. Jackson, shifting himself slightly in his chair, 
turned a tranquil gaze on the young man's burning face. Well, I have it on a pretty good authority, in fact, and old Catherine's herself that the family reduced Countess Alaska's allowance considerably, while she definitely refused to go back to her husband. And as, by this refusal, she also forfeits the money settled on her when she married, which Olansky was ready to make over to her if she returned. Why? What the devil do you mean, my dear boy, by asking me what I mean? Mr. Jackson good-humoredly retorted. Archer moved toward the mantelpiece and bent over to knock his ashes into the grate. I don't know anything of Madame Onaska's private affairs, but I don't need to, to be certain that what you insinuate. Oh, I don't. It's Lefferts, for one, Mr. Jackson interposed. Lefferts? Who made love to her and got snubbed for it? Archer broke out contemptuously. Ah, oh, did he? snapped the other, as if this were exactly the fact he had been lying a trap for. He still sat sideways from the fire, so that his hard old gaze held Archer's face as if in a spring of steel. Well, well, it's a pity she didn't go back before Beaufort's cropper, he repeated. If she goes now, and if he fails, it will only confirm the general impression, which isn't by any means peculiar to Beaufort's, by the way. Oh, she won't go back now. Less than ever. Archer had no sooner said it than he had once more. The feeling that it was exactly what Mr. Jackson had been waiting for. The old gentleman considered him attentively. That's your opinion, eh? Well, not up, you know. But everybody will tell you that. The few pennies Madora Manson has left are all in Beaufort's hands. And how the two women are to keep their heads above water unless he does, I can imagine. Of course, Madame Alaska may still soften old Catherine, who has been the most inexorably opposed to her staying, and old Catherine could make her any allowance she chooses. But we all know that she hates parting with good money, and the rest of the family have no particular interest in keeping Madame Alaska here. Archer was burning with unveiling grot. He was exactly in the state when a man is sure to do something stupid knowing all the while that he is doing it. He saw that Mr. Jackson had been instantly struck by the fact that Madame Alaska's differences with her grandmother and her other relations were not known to him, and that the old gentleman had drawn his own conclusions as the reasons for Arcus' exclusion from the family councils. This fact warned Arcus to grow verily, but the insinuations about Beaufort made him reckless. He was mindful, however, if not of his own danger, at least of the fact that Mr. Jackson was under his mother's roof, and consequently his guest. All New York scrupulously observed the etiquette of hospitality, and no one discuss discussion with a guest was ever allowed to degenerate into a disagreement. Shall we go up and join my mother, he suggests curtly as Mr. Jackson's last can of ashes dropped into the brass ashtray at his elbow. On the drive homeward, May remained utterly silent. Through the darkness, he still felt her enveloped in her menacing blush. What its menace mean, he couldn't guess, but he was sufficiently warned by the fact that Madame Alenska's name had evoked it. They went upstairs, and he turned into the library. She usually followed him, but he heard her passing down the passage to her bedroom. May, he called out impatiently, and she came back with a slight glance of surprise at his tone. End of the section, page 186